Give you a bottle of water. Thank you. Okay, so uh, let's start the lecture. Uh, so I would like to introduce you Amin Rafi, and, uh, who's going to speak about biohacking and more in detail about empowering the mind. So I would like to thank you for coming to Hackers Congress uh, Paralympics 2016. And uh, yeah, and uh, hopefully you will learn how to become a better person during the lecture and like take away a lot of stuff, good stuff. So. Uh, thanks for that. Uh, just a side informational thingy. Uh, Amanda Johnson is going to speak in Paper Hub at 8 p.m. Uh, it's going to be a Skype talk, so you all know about that. Also, uh, this lecture is recorded, so if you don't want to be on footage, just uh, make sure you are not passing uh, by the camera or doing stuff like that. So uh, make sure you don't do that if you don't want to be in the footage. So thank you. And floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you all for coming. I hope you can get something of value out of the conversation. And if I have to time at the end, I'll include one more thing. But just to begin, um, I guess just to give you a background story, I've always been interested in doing things that challenge the mind and allow us to kind of progress past our limitations. Um, I do really believe that any limitations we put are mentally breakable and through work you can prove this to yourself. So, you know, probably since a teenager I questioned everything. I guess uh, I didn't really believe many of the mainstream articles, news, ways of living and I'm sure a lot of you here can resonate with that idea. So, you know, I always seek out ways of altering myself. Um, how can I alter my behavior, my thoughts, uh, how do people interact with one another, how these things can be done. And through my search, I went through psychology, philosophy, um, dietary components, and gathered all the information and really wanted to reflect on how I can incorporate these within my life and how it can positively influence myself with it. Um, so that's just some background story. It's kind of uh, least important in comparison to everything else. But yeah, so Carl Jung was, was one of the psychiatrists that I looked into, and his method of understanding the human brain was uh, remarkable for me anyways. And he was a Swiss-based psychiatrist, passed away. But he was one of the first people to look into the collective consciousness. So, you know, he went and visited uh, numerous tribes around the world and came to the conclusion that despite the tribes not having any connection with one another, they see similar shapes, objects or things in their dreams. So uh, through various research, through you know, uh, conducting conversations with a lot of them, he came to the conclusion that on an unconscious level we're all connected. But that's not why I brought him up. The reason I brought him up is that, you know, anything as he says that you make unconscious conscious directly alive. So, you know, once you gain power over your thoughts, over how you believe things should be, you can have a great influence on yourself and hopefully through inspiration, others around you. So the motive, what was my motive? You know, I needed to explain how I came to this point. So the desire to strengthen the mind, the desire to break through barriers, overcome limitations, and gain control of choices that were not made by me. So. What are choices that are not made by me? So things that through environment, through upbringing, through culture, through uh, media even, and through schooling system that were placed into my mind that I believe were my own choices. So how do you break through these? So first you've got to understand what was placed there by yourself through a conscious decision and what was introduced by an exterior element such as your environment, your school system, such and such. And through doing this, I wanted to show myself ah, things that I think are not possible are actually possible. Or things that I think are very hard, in the end I can look back and say, ah, that was quite achievable and doable. So, to give you an example, how do you treat a sick tree? So you don't look at the branches and you start injecting the branches or take out the leaves and start spraying the leaves. In some aspects you do, but in most cases you change the soil you look at the sunshine and see if it's receiving enough sunlight. You alter the water that receives, the nutrients, and in the end, of, at the end of the day, the environment as a whole plays a huge factor in the well-being um, of the tree. So, in the same manner, why do we not do the same thing for ourselves? So, if we have certain issues, we consume people's tablets or anything else, 
to directly attack the problem. Or rarely do we look into the base of why this problem has occurred and try and alter whether it's the environment, our thoughts, uh, consumption of food, or anything else that may lead to affect um, that sickness or issue and try and resolve it. So it's kind of a band-aid effect that we've kind of grown up to accept, which is you know, treated directly rather than try and look at the entire picture. So just like the plan, exterior problems are, uh, you know, if you have knee pains or something like that, are usually brought upon by something much larger from the interior. And the exterior is usually a window into those problems, so it gives you a hint, you know, if it comes down to a big enough problem, your body lets you know, hold on, there's these things wrong, you need to do it. So an example would be if you get a headache. Most people, when they get a headache, might consume ibuprofen to relieve uh, the inflammation, or they might take Panadol to kill the nerves that send the signals. But more importantly, what you should do is find out why you have the headache. So consume water, consume food. If you've been in the sun for too long, get yourself into a cooler place, calm the body down. So in the same manner, um, I want to link it back to, I guess, the reason I link it to exterior things is because I find uh, people that have, for example, really nice cars, look after it really well. They make sure the right fuel goes into it, so you don't put the E10, for example, fuel into it. They service it regularly and they follow the recommendations of what needs to be done to look after the device. So in the same manner, if you have a laptop that's DC electric, um, you don't put AC in it, because obviously you're going to ruin it. So why is it that we don't have the same mentality when it comes to our own body, without which all the exterior would be pointless? So that, for me, was a turning point, because you know, I started to look around and saw People care a lot more about you know, their tools, chainsaws, um, hammers and everything else much more than they do themselves. And that was a very confusing concept for me because I felt we also have instruction manual. We also have recommendation of health and what we need to do. But it is that simple. You need to listen to your body. Your body wants to be healthy. It wants to perform at its best. You know, how, how long has it taken for the human uh, body to get to where it is? It wasn't an overnight thing. It's taken millions of years of progression, if you want to look at the evolutionary perspective, or from a creation perspective, the miracle of life within us. Whichever path you take, you've got to understand the body has the tools and the, has the requirement to want to be healthy. So you just need to be able to communicate with it correctly. So the challenge. Um, the challenge for me was breaking barriers, breaking mental uh, barriers, sorry that already existed. So turmeric is a 5,000 year old Indian spice, yet it has shown to be more effective at relieving inflammation problems than ibuprofen. This for me is very, very remarkable because you have something that's 5,000 years old that is outdoing medical science, something that we uh, pride ourselves on for pushing to the limits. So something that was around 5,000 years old is doing better than medical research. So it made me question, what else is out there that is probably better for us and more effective at dealing with our body than what we have come to develop through science. And it's all about systems. So, uh, this was a funny story actually. I met a random uh, Buddhist monk in south of Spain. And he brought this up to me and I thought it was very, very inspirational. That, you know, the story with the hare and the turtle is not anything else but to show the persistence of the hair. So whatever you're doing, whatever you're trying to achieve, you can just do it in small steps and be persistent about it. The turtle was not more intelligent, it didn't come from a rich family that provided better things. It was just a regular turtle, but what allowed it to win was its persistent de de determination. Um, whereas the rabbit allowed its uh, speed to make it a bit arrogant and think, oh, I'm going to win this anyways. At the other point, Dr. Wardberg actually concluded this in 1931, which is you need to keep the body in an alkaline state. In an acidic state, you cause problems, diseases, etc., etc. Um, so this is a known fact from a long time ago. And again, you know, I tried to look into it and like, how can we allow our body to remain in its most natural state, you know, to perform in a way as though it was designed to be at its peak. To keep it alkaline. This was the most uh, repeated topic that I came about. Keep your body alkaline, remove preservatives, remove things that get in the way of your body trying to, uh, trying to get rid of diseases or trying to get rid of 
bacteria or five bacteria organisms. So I looked into what kind of foods I could incorporate within my diet. You know, again, there's no need to completely shift and get rid of everything else that I've been consuming. And I'm not here to tell you what to eat, I'm not here to tell you how to live, I'm not here to tell you what to be vegetarian or anything else. If you see something you like, incorporate it. If you don't, that's fine. But I started to realize, okay, so the more alkaline foods seem to be things that are naturally produced in the environment, so, such as vegetables, fruits, and things that are speaking to your body's language. So to put this in, I guess, in a programming way, which some of you may relate to, if you have something written in JavaScript, you can't feel it HTML. It's a completely different code. So your body has a certain code that sends the enzymes to deal with certain foods. So when we give it something that it doesn't recognize, you know, things that are newly produced, such as preservative and things that are man-made, that are very, very recent in comparison to the biological evolution of plants and other things that we can consume, you start to produce errors within your body. You know, it's, there's no difference between it. So the source code needs to match what the body likes. And that seems to be alkaline food, things that your body knows how to break down, how to deal with, and has been for a very long time. And the other part was like, do it in small steps, you know, find out what works. You can't just suddenly shift and be like, oh, you know, I'm going to stop eating acidic food from now on and just no more sauce because you'll go crazy. It doesn't work, you know. You can't, you can't suddenly get up tomorrow morning and say, I'm going to run a marathon because, yeah, you need to train for it, you know, you need to, you need to break down, you need to cry, you need to push yourself and eventually you get to that goal. So again, it's not about running a marathon, it's not about changing it completely, but it's about finding out what you like and what works for you and incorporating that. So I did this with the thought of not eating meat, for example. I really wanted to just try it out. I was always a person that believed that as human beings we should consume meat. And I still do believe that, but unfortunately what they do to the meat is not the way I want it to be. But, I was like, alright, let's try it out, let's prove myself wrong, because I don't believe that I can stop eating meat, so I tried it out, and it worked. I was like, alright, well, that was cool, what else can we incorporate? So I stopped eating fish as well along the way. So in small steps, I tried things that I didn't believe that I could do, just to show myself that I can do them. And then using the same method, using the same pattern of behaviour, I was able to adopt this and you know, apply it to other factors in my life, things that I didn't enjoy. So it's start small steps progressively, working on behaviours, working on habits, working on things that I believe I could alter. Or even if I didn't believe I could alter, give it a go anyways and see where it will take you. So the method. You need to completely empty yourself. I don't mean, you know, sit in a room, empty your mind. Yeah, you can do that too. But for me, most of my work throughout this whole progress and journey has been unlearning rather than learning. So a lot of it has to do, there's so much information in our heads, you know, through school, through environment, through academic progression, that it fills our brains up with lots of thoughts and desires and unconscious desires even. So you need to unlearn these things, well, for me anyways, you don't need to do it. Um, and along the way I learned, alright, there's so many false uh, information, there's so much false information within my thoughts that I have to remove. And the only way to remove them is to, again, through action, show yourself, oh, okay, this works. So in the same manner, I didn't think I could stop eating meat. So I did it, so my brain can see, all right, I'm capable of it. I want to show you this video, which I find quite inspirational. Um, There's something I want to tell you about uh, the stress and how we are full of stress, okay? And I think it's an important thing because uh, many people have told me from my lectures is the one thing they remember, okay? And I was sitting in a dentist's office and looked at an article that said, how do lobsters grow? I don't care how lobsters grow. But I was interested in it. 
and it points out that a lobster is a soft, mushy animal that lives inside of a rigid shell. That rigid shell does not expand. Well, how can the lobster grow? Well, as the lobster grows, that shell becomes very confining. And the, kind of the lobster feels itself under pressure and uncomfortable. It goes under a rock formation to protect itself from predatory fish, casts off the shell, and produces a new one. Well, eventually, that shell becomes very uncomfortable as it grows, right? Back under the rocks. And the lobster repeats this numerous times. The stimulus for the lobster to be able to grow is that it feels uncomfortable. Right? Now, if lobsters had doctors, they would never grow. Because as soon as the lobster feels uncomfortable, goes to the doctor, gets a Valium, gets a Percocet, feels fine. Never comes off its shell. So I think that we have to realize is that we have to realize that times of stress are also times that are signals for growth. And if we use adversity properly, we can grow through adversity. So Wim Hof from Netherlands, uh, I find really inspirational guy. You know, I watched a few of his videos and I was, my, my mind was blown because I couldn't believe a human being could just sit in the house and walk around. You know, he sent to the, he, he did a lap around the polar circle or half a marathon around the polar circle, which was like minus 30 something degrees. I didn't think it was possible for a human being to be able to withstand such temperatures. I didn't think we were biologically, physiologically capable of such things. So I got really interested in the topic. I looked further into it. I saw that he also did a marathon in the Sahara Desert without drinking any food or water. I was like, wow, this guy is crazy. You know, is he, is he like a superman? Is he one of those excellent people? You know, are, are other people able to do it? So I looked into it and I found out that he actually praises the idea that anything he can do, others can also do. And then I found out that he has a two-week training course that he takes you to Poland. And he trains you for a week and then he gets you to climb the mountains around, you know, minus 25 degrees just in your shorts. I found this again very crazy. He went up to Mount Everest and he climbed it up to, I think, 6,000 meters or something, um, just in his shorts. Just in his shorts, Mount Everest. I thought this was very interesting. So I looked into it further and I realized, all right, the mind again can be trained. You know, you can be trained to do things that you don't think is possible. So I put myself to test again and experiment on myself, which I love doing. You should always experiment on yourself safely. Um, so in about January last, no, just here, it hasn't changed yet. In January this year, um, I started training and I started, you know, slowly taking the temperature down from like 30 degrees in the shower to like 25 and eventually maybe to like 20 and I watched a few other videos and I realized I'm playing games with myself, you know, like, ah, oh, let's just turn it down from 20 to 19 degrees. No, just turn the whole thing off. So I said, all right, I'll turn it off and see how that works. So I went in the shower a few months afterwards, you know, let the body get used to it. You can't just go into it because you'll shock your system. It was all about gradual movement. So I tried it, I was like, oh wow, this is really cold, but like, it's not bad, I can see how it could be possible. So eventually after a few months, I just cut it completely out, and that was about, I would say at least five months ago, since I took a warm shower. And I love it now, you know, I was saying the other day when I moved into my new place, I actually wanted to let the landlords know, sorry, your water doesn't get cold enough. And I think I would be the first person to ever say, sorry, your water doesn't get cold enough. I was annoyed that it had an automated release of warm water going through it that didn't allow it to go to its full cold temperature. I got really annoyed by that. And then I took a few other warm showers and I just didn't really like it. I felt very weird taking a warm shower after taking cold showers for like five months. So what did it do for me? For me, it had significant changes. So I'm a person that usually hates the cold. Um, you can see generically I'm not designed to be in the snow. I can handle hot temperatures much better than I can do cold temperatures. But I wanted to remove this. I was like, I can adapt. I'm a human being, I should be able to progress. So I tried this, and through this, I can now withstand cold temperatures much better, obviously not like Wim Hof sitting in the snow. I haven't tried that, I have to try. But it allowed me to say, all right, I can change certain aspects of my physiological function. What else did it do? I feel it makes you look better, it makes your skin tighter, that's always a good thing. 
Um, makes you much more energetic. Um, it, it releases endorphins or the love hormones. So you feel a lot better. Um, it's even used by psychotherapists as a way of uh, increasing your endorphins, so dealing with antidepressants, um, with depression, instead of using antidepressants. So it has huge, huge um, benefits. The other thing which I found remarkable was the autonomic nervous system. So through this, Wim Path, they did multiple experiments on him in the Netherlands, and they came to the conclusion that he was able to influence his uh, autonomic nervous system, which up to then, the scientific community believed was, there was no way he could influence it. That's why it's called the autonomic nervous system. But he showed that he could. He also showed through the people that he trained that he was, um, he was not the only one that could do it, that the people that he trained were also able to do it. He showed that with the injection of E. coli, uh, which is supposed to bring about flu-like symptoms, so you get headaches, uh, nauseous, cramps, pains, that he didn't get any of the symptoms, nor did any of the people that he had trained. And they had a, a control group as well to compare it to, obviously. Um, so the function that works here is breathing. Um, so you fill your blood up with a high level of oxygen, which decreases the CO2, which decreases the acidic, the acidic uh, balance of your pH level. So instead of decreasing the pH level, it goes up. Your body can deal with uh, bacteria and other factors that are negative for your body much better when the oxygen levels are higher. So we have seen, I have shown you, yeah. So the cancer thrives in aerobic uh, conditions or acidic conditions. So just through breathing alone, you can influence that function. Just breathing, no drops, just deep breaths. I found it crazy, so I started doing it myself. So the point is that you keep breathing for about, let's say, 30 breaths. And the idea is that you breathe in more than what you let out. So you let the breath come in completely, and then let half or maybe 60% of it out. And then you breathe in again. And you repeat this about 30 times. Uh, I had actually stumbled upon this before even knowing about this. I was like one day just trying breathing for myself and I started sweating and steam came from my body and I was like, what is happening? My, my arms and everything locked up and I got a sudden rush of tingling feeling through my body. I thought I was, like, I was having a, like, I don't know, a stroke or something. But later when I found out about this, I was like, oh wow, I stumbled upon this without even realizing. So the brown fat factor is a huge, huge uh, uh, important part of this because it generates heat very efficiently. Whereas white fat, or the normal fat that we have, which overweight people actually have a very little or no brown fat at all, um, is very efficient in dealing with it. So, it's good for your body, whole child. It's good for a lot of different aspects. And, yeah, this, this was a really interesting part of his uh, procedure. So the ATP creation, um, the change created, uh, when your body is acidic or lacks oxygen, it becomes very inefficient at dealing with this. So that's why you, know, you, all, you feel very out of breath. So to make yourself out to actually defeat that part. Um, so yeah, this is another thing that I decided to incorporate and I hope by the end of this year I can go into the canals as Wim Hof did and go for a swim and send in the video and say thank you for inspiring me to do something. That